get started. Okay, great. I'll introduce you again. Good evening, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Suzanne Wasserman. and I'm the director of the Gotham Center for New York City History. I do have to remind you how much we enjoy getting checks from you, and to thank those of you who have already kindly given to the Gotham Center, you know who you are. Our next fall 2013 forum will take place on October 23rd, and is a film screening of Sasua Make a Better World. It tells the story of Dominican and Jewish teenagers in New York's Washington Heights neighborhood, who together with the legendary film director Liz Suedos, put on a musical about the Dominican Republic's rescue of 800 Jews from Hitler. Award-winning filmmakers Peter Miller and Renee Silverman interweave this little-known and racially complex Holocaust story with an intimate behind-the-scenes portrait of the making of the theater production. In a neighborhood where Jews and Latinos live side by side but rarely interact, the theater project brings its young actors on an extraordinary journey of discovery of what unites them both in the past and in the present, and I hope you will join us. It's going to be in the recital hall, which is right around the corner on the 23rd of October at 6.30 p.m. Without further delay, let me introduce tonight's speaker, Marjorie Hines. She is a civil liberties lawyer and the founding director of the Free Expression Policy Project. She formerly directed the ACLU's Art Censorship Project and was a fellow at the Brennan Center for Justice. Her previous book, Not in Front of the Children, won the American Library Association's 2002 Award for Best Published Work in the Field of Intellectual Freedom. Her current book, Priests of Our Democracy, the subject of, our, of tonight's talk, has been called, quote, a masterpiece of legal journalism, end quote, by University of Michigan professor Alan Wald. Priests grew out of the, her work at the ACLU on academic freedom cases and recently received the Hugh M. Hefner First Amendment Award in book publishing. Marjorie is an adjunct professor at NYU and graduated from Harvard Law School. And I, I also, afterwards, we're going to do a Q&A, and then her book is for sale, and she'll be happy to sign copies for you out front. Thank you very much, Marjorie. Thank you, Suzanne, and thanks for coming. It's a great pleasure to be here. Gotham Center is a great institution. Um, so Priests of Our Democracy is about academic freedom, where it comes from, what it means, and how the US Supreme Court, in response to the Red Hunts of the 1950s, eventually recognized it as a, quote, special concern of the First Amendment. So when I started out, uh, I saw this book mostly as a history of the great Supreme Court cases that I'd often cited in my briefs at the ACLU. Um, what I discovered, though, as I began to dig through the archives, uh, were also dramatic um, personal stories, stories about New York City about the teachers and professors uh, who went left in the 1930s and 40s, about those who resisted the anti-communist investigations that were especially harsh in this city, and about ex-communists who suffered excruciating moral dilemmas over the forced ritual of naming names of others they'd known in the movement. The left-wing teachers union in New York was a particular thorn in the side of the city's administrators and was an, uh, a main target of the purge in New York. So here, a uh, cover image of the book, Members of the College Teachers Union at New York City's 1938 May Day Parade. Okay. So the, the quote I used for the title of the book, um, Priests of Our Democracy does not refer to the Supreme Court justices, as some people thought. Um, it refers to teachers. And it came from a... Um, 1952 case, a rather obscure case that the Supreme Court decided, um, which struck down, quite unusual in 1962, uh, a typical Cold War era loyalty oath. The decision turned on a technicality, and it had absolutely no effect on the ongoing um, anti-subversive loyalty programs that were sweeping the country. But just as Felix Frankfurter, ironically, um, for the most part, a great apostle of judicial restraint, we won't strike down anything that the Congress or the states do that's politically controversial. When it came to academic freedom, Frankfurter had a different idea. And um, so he writes uh, in a concurring opinion in this case um, that priests, teachers are the priests of our democracy uh, because, as you can see from the quote, um, 
This is not about some special privilege for teachers, that they should have special First Amendment protection from retaliation or from losing their job for their politics because they're somehow elite. It's about the role teachers serve uh, in a democracy, ideally, um, in inculcating those habits of open-mindedness that alone make for responsible citizens. So th it's all about a whole philosophy of education, not about rote learning, but about critical thinking. Um, I like this detail from Raphael's School of Athens. I wanted to use it on the cover of the book, but um, the publisher said it would be too confusing and people would think it was a book about art history. So we used the teachers demonstrating in their gowns instead. Okay, the New York Teachers Union. Um, a little background. The first big red scare um, in US history just after World War I and just after the Bolshevik Revolution uh, for a variety of reasons, really decimated America's then, before the war, quite popular socialist movement. Um, but by the 1930s, with fascism triumphant in Spain, Italy, and Germany, and on the rise at home, and with the collapse of capitalism during the Great Depression, thousands of Americans, including lots of teachers, were drawn to the left, and the Communist Party uh, especially after in the late 30s adopted a popular front against fascism um, program, was simply the most effective organization around working on progressive causes. And one of them um, was fighting against racism. The, the CP was the only um, white majority organization in, as early as the 1930s that was fighting against race discrimination. And all this, this pamphlet, which was put out by the teachers union, which certainly had many communists in its leadership, but was also had many non-communists. Um, this pamphlet actually didn't come out until the early 50s, but it was as early as the 30s that uh, the teachers union was uh, advocating against this kinds of, kind of really appalling uh, racism in textbooks that uh, the kids were being given in the New York schools. And they made real efforts to organize uh, in the minority communities not only to get rid of these racism in the textbooks, everything okay? Oh, but um, to try to persuade the Board of Education, which was quite intransigent on this subject, to, um, to adopt curriculum materials uh, and programs that would actually emphasize, rather than denigrate, um, the achievements and contributions of the African American community. All of which is not to say that the Communist Party of the United States did not have some major, perhaps fatal flaws, the most glaring being unquestioning defense of the USSR and constantly changing its party line depending on what was in the interests of the USSR. And that flaw uh, made the party certainly a convenient target in the 50s, uh, both for liberal anti-communists um, who contributed, as, as my book um, points out, contributed greatly uh, to the kind of over-the-top anti-communist hysteria that took hold after World War II, um, and without whose support uh, the McCarthy period, as we call it, might have been much less um, intense and pervasive and harmful than it was, uh, but also right-wingers who um, loved to attack the Communist Party and all communists uh, as a way of trying to stop the civil rights movement, labor organizing, and a variety of other causes, uh, simply by calling them either communist infiltrated or just pointing out that their goals were consistent with the Communist Party goals. So some people, including myself, think about the tragedy of the American left because it became uh, so predominantly communist in the 1930s and early 40s. Um, but there were lots of people who joined it and were um, the most dedicated and the most enthusiastic activists for progressive causes and just sort of put to one side whatever the party line was at any particular time. So very brief history of the American left there. OK, Brooklyn College. Uh, in the late 1930s, uh, New York City's Board of Higher Education, uh, which ultimately morphed into CUNY, um, was looking for a new president of the newly established Brooklyn College. And Harry Gideons uh, had excellent 
credentials, but he made his combativeness clear before the BHE, Board of Higher Education, before they hired him. And he told the board he did not intend, quote, to live in peace with the teachers union. It would be open war from the word go, and it will get worse as time goes on. And once in office uh, at Brooklyn College, Gideon's um, battled both teachers and students that he considered communist sympathizers. Actually, it was radical students um, at Brooklyn College uh, who recruited teachers into the Communist Party. One of the early converts was an English professor named Bernard Grabagne. Um, there'll be more about him soon. Uh, another was the expert in German literature, Harry Slockauer. Um, it was primarily the fear of fascism, Slockauer later said, that drew him into what seemed at the time the most effective anti-fascist organization around. And Slockauer will also reappear in this story. A history of Brooklyn College written by one of Gideon's deans acknowledged that some of the communists were teachers of unique and outstanding ability, quote, and all of them refrained from spreading overtly propaganda in their classrooms, um, in contrast to the accusations that were um, frequently made that we have to get rid of all the communists, all the teachers who are communists because they will indoctrinate the students. Uh, didn't happen. Uh, but this dean in his book uh, uh, said that basically justified Gideon's desire to get rid of the um, communists or suspected communists on campus because uh, their influence was insidious because they encouraged students outside class in, quote, creating disorders and disregarding regulations. And what he didn't specify was that the regulations that the students were disregarding were essentially rules Gideon's and his administration had created in order to make sure there was no um, free speech on campus for those whose views uh, he disapproved of. Okay. The first attack on academic freedom in New York City as the 1940s began involved the English philosopher, atheist, and free love advocate Bertrand Russell. In 1940, Russell accepted a professorship at City College. Um, Episcopal and Catholic church leaders joined with right-wing newspapers to protest the hiring. And they cooked up a lawsuit on behalf of a taxpayer um, who had a teenage daughter uh, and claimed that not only was her tax money now going to go to support this um, immoral person, uh, but that her daughter might be harmed, even though, of course, uh, girls could not go to City College at this time. So they got, how they managed to get the judge that they did, I don't know. But they found a judge who um, disapproved of Russell as much as they did. And he basically voided the appointment by the city college on grounds of immorality. And he explained, now academic freedom was not yet recognized in the courts, but it was a concept that was widely recognized um, in the universities. And the judge explained he certainly wouldn't want to interfere with, quote, valid academic freedom, but he wouldn't tolerate its being used as a cloak to promote acts forbidden by law, and presumably what he's, in the minds of impressionable students, and presumably what he's referring to is Bert Russell having been a, an advocate of free love, sex before marriage, sex outside marriage, acts at the time uh, prohibited by the criminal law. Mayor LaGuardia, often uh, considered, and was, a progressive on many issues, was not great on issues of censorship and free speech. Uh, he did nothing to support City College, and in fact wrote to the head of the BHE, quote, and I found this in the city archives, priceless, why is it that we always select someone with a boil on his neck or a blister on his fanny? <laughs> so LaGuardia was no help, and Russell never did get the job. Here's Professor Grabagne. The New York State Legislature responded to Russell's appointment by passing a law um, requiring a committee that had already been set up uh, to study educational conditions in the state, requiring this committee to investigate, quote, un-American and subversive organizations in public schools and colleges. This was the famous or infamous Rap Kudere Committee, named after its co-chairs. Uh, and in 1940, December 19, it starts in the fall of 1940, calling people in for private interviews, uh, and then public hearings starting in December 1940. 
And Rab Kruder, uh really pioneered uh, the red hunting techniques that would be used so widely in the 50s by the McCarthy Committee, the House on American Activities Committee, and others, subpoenaing suspects for private interrogations, then if they didn't cooperate, subjecting them to sensationalized public hearings uh, to maximize the stigma. By the time of the Rap Coudere hearings, Professor Grabanye of Brooklyn College, like lots of other people who'd been in the Communist Party for relatively short periods of time, had quit. Uh, and he'd gone public with his accusations that the party slavishly followed the commands of Stalin. Uh, so having gone public, of course, he was subpoenaed uh, by the Rap Coudere Committee. And uh, at first in private hearings, uh, he named names of others uh, who were in his Communist Party unit at Brooklyn College. Uh, when the hearings were then made public with all the press attention, uh, Gurbanye somehow thought he wouldn't have to repeat this, uh, this um, ritual, but of course they forced him to, to name the names publicly. Um, and Gurbanye named um, eight Brooklyn College faculty as communists, including his English department colleague, Frederick Ewan, um, for whom an academic freedom center is now uh, named at NYU's Tenement Library, and he named Harry Slockauer. Uh, later on in private hearings, uh, he named many more people, and um, the committee kept pressing him, and it's unclear uh, what uh, criteria he was using for making a judgment that somebody was in the Communist Party. He saw somebody at a meeting, it might have been an open meeting, did they have a party card, did they not have a party card? Uh, those were technicalities that the committee was really not interested in uh, because their interests really went beyond the technicality of party membership to a much broader kind of purge of people who were on the left. Uh, so, and of course the questions that the committee asked, both Rap Coudere in 1940-41 and then later in the 50s, went well beyond the famous $64,000 question, well, you, ever in the Communist Party, but um, books you had read, magazines you subscribed to, meetings you went to, petitions you signed, a um, long list of political questions. Okay, so the teachers' union um, brings a variety of legal challenges to the procedures that Rap Coudere Committee is using, and they lose them all. And by the spring of 1941, uh, these professors who have been named have to testify or they will be held in contempt of the committee and go to jail um, and lose their jobs. So they were in a dilemma. Uh, they could answer questions about past or present Communist Party membership and other political activities, uh, but they'd almost surely lose their job if they admitted um, present Communist Party membership. And if you remember, this was just in the wake of the Hitler-Stalin pact, so um, the popular front against fascism quickly ended and uh, communists were easy targets. So, and, and even if it was past Communist Party membership, they would have to purge themselves of that sin by naming names of others. So being honest, uh, if you were or had ever been in the Communist Party, was uh, carried some real, um, some real uh, problems. Uh, you could refuse to participate and stand on your First Amendment rights. After all, the First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech, and that by then had been applied to state governments as well. So if you can't make a law abridging the freedom of speech, why are you a legislative investigating committee investigating the freedom of speech? But um, they would, they would uh, be jailed for contempt because the First Amendment was not considered um, by the courts to be an acceptable defense, and you'd lose your job. Or you could deny um, past or present Communist Party membership, that is, you could commit perjury, which is what many of them did. Um, this was obviously risky legally, not to mention um, unpalatable uh, on ethical grounds for some people. And I have a quote in the book from one former Brooklyn College professor uh, who did that and um, talks about how, uh, how um, conflicted he was about it. Uh, but uh, they could justify it as a form of resistance to what they considered illegitimate um, political inquisition. And uh, because the Board of Higher Education followed the, the legal rule 
that in order to convict somebody of perjury, you need two witnesses against them, not just one, you know, I say yes, he said no. Um, and because Grabanier was the only witness at Brooklyn College naming these folks, they didn't lose their jobs. Um, Slockauer didn't, for, uh, Gideons didn't forget this, however. Um, at City College, there was more than one witness, more than one ex-communist uh, informer who named people they'd seen at meetings and so forth. And so quite a number of people at City College, um, more than 30, lost their jobs during Rap Kudir. Just an example of uh, what some of the rhetoric was like, Brooklyn Eagle. Um, it says Svengali methods. And again, there was no evidence that teachers at any level were using Svengali methods uh, to indoctrinate their students, but this was typical kind of propaganda. Okay, this is gonna be the quickest introduction to the Cold War <laughs> um, anti-communism that you've ever heard. But really, just after the war, Soviet Union, our heroic ally, is now our major <clears throat> enemy. Um, and indeed, on the foreign policy front, the Soviet Union was expans expansionist and took over Eastern Europe. Uh, Churchill makes his famous Iron Curtain speech. Uh, the problem was that on the domestic front, uh, the Com Communist Party and its affiliated organizations, its so-called fronts, uh, people who are close to or supportive of one Communist Party program or another, were not any kind of threat uh, to national security. Uh, but because of the external threat and because of a whole variety of different political agendas that different groups in America had, and I mentioned both anti-communist liberals and um, right-wingers who wanted to undermine other kinds of progressive movements, um, the McCarthy period began and uh, had a kind of intensity in the U.S. that it did not have anywhere else. Uh, the anti-communism did not have anywhere else. Um, so also 1946, a lesser known fact, but this is important to my story. Um, Cardinal Spellman, uh, very powerful, sometimes called the American Pope, very good buddies with J. Edgar Hoover, uh, virulently anti-communist, um, is asked by the mayor for a list of suggestions of people to be uh, appointed to the New York City Board of Education, which manages the K-1 schools. Uh, and uh, the mayor adopts one of his suggestions. George Timon um, didn't have any credentials, any expertise in education. He was a lawyer and uh, had been active in co-sponsoring a number of pro-fascist, pro-Mussolini rallies in the late 30s. Uh, and Timon will be the one who, um, he couldn't have done it alone, but uh, he's the one who's really leading the charge against um, the teachers' union. Um, with charges that it's communist-led or communist-infiltrated, um, but the real agenda, or and an additional agenda, is um, uh, to, try to, to bust this union, which has been um, a thorn in the side of the Board of Education. So Timon is really the one who, who is responsible for the New York City Board of Education uh, investigations and purges being quite as, uh, really the most draconian in the country. Um, Harry Truman is in here, his 1947 loyalty program, and we would call it the McCarthy era, but um, you could really call it the Truman era because long before McCarthy was on the scene, um, Truman tries to preempt uh, the Republican Party on this um, accusations that the Democrats are soft on communism. The 1948 election is coming up. He creates this massive loyalty program for federal employees, uh, which basically has two parts. Um, one is anybody who was accused by any anonymous informer or there's something in their FBI file uh, that they may be um, uh, communist or subversive, is subject to a loyalty review process and ultimately to termination from their job. And the second is even if you don't have any evidence that this person has done or said anything, um, if they are alleged to be a member of any uh, a long list of organizations that the attorney general is going to um, have to create under this Truman executive order, the so-called famous attorney general's list. Um, it's guilt by association in its purest form. Uh, simply being accused of being a member of one of these organizations uh, is enough to get you fired and will get you fired. 
and of course, um, no procedures really for the organizations to contest, to contest their listing. Uh, and as we'll see, the states start to imitate uh, the Truman Loyalty Program. Oh, and of course, the Hollywood 10, also early in this period, um, the most famous of the many hearings that the House Committee on, on American Activities uh, was holding, um, highly publicized, highly sensationalized, and the writers and directors who refused to um, cooperate with the committee, basically um, standing on their First Amendment rights, all are held in contempt of Congress, and go to jail. And meanwhile, the Hollywood producers who had announced before the hearings that they would never tolerate anything as un-American as a blacklist, um, promptly initiate a blacklist um, uh, in Hollywood. OK, well, we're back to New York City. And um, the New York City Board of Education starts in the uh, late 40s to call in teachers uh, who are suspected of communism. And basically, they're calling in the, the leaders of the teachers' union. And um, these were the first eight who refused to cooperate in the administrative interrogations uh, that were going on. All teachers' union leaders, uh, all Jewish, as were almost all the uh, teachers and professors who were victims of the Red Hunt in New York City. Uh, and what happened was um, they were brought up on charges and ultimately convicted in an administrative trial, not of ever having any, done anything improper uh, in the classroom, or even of having subversive or communist beliefs or membership. But they're brought up on charges of insubordination and conduct on becoming a teacher because they didn't cooperate in the investigation. They didn't answer the questions. Uh, and that became a very convenient means of driving people out of um, teaching. Uh, Alice Citrin over on the, um, your right, your left. Your left, thank you. Um, she was an especially uh, beloved teacher. She taught in Harlem. She's a kindergarten teacher. She was a very dedicated community activist. A parade of African-American parents came in to talk about the bridges she would built uh, in the community. Uh, between teachers and parents. Didn't make any difference. I found um, an interesting memo in the Board of Education, anti-communist files in the municipal archives, which shows us that surveillance uh, by police agents um, did not start recently. Uh, so the New York City Police Department um, is surveilling these teachers, and this memo um, reveals or reports that they've discovered that Alice Citrin is living um, with a uh, Communist Party activist named Isidore Begin and suggested that even if none of the charges against her stick, quote, it looks as if we could make out quite a good case for conduct on becoming a teacher on grounds of having been Begin's mistress. So they were uh, looking for anything they could find. Um, the teachers' union really um, put up a fight for a long time. And uh, so here they're, they're picketing um, the loyalty investigations. And then on the other side is a um, cartoonist for the teachers' union newspaper who is making his comment on uh, the priorities of the Board of Education. And school conditions are in the wastebasket, as you can see. So just one example from the, these interrogations. Um, the interrogator for the Board of Education was a guy named Saul Moskov who had been, who was on loan from the city lawyer's office. And Moskov is um, pretty active in the Jewish community. And as I mentioned, all the teachers um, who are being interrogated are Jewish, uh, at least ethnically, if not very religious about it. So an example of just one exchange. And this comes about because in 19, the, the, the questioning that goes on, um, if you are an ex-communist and you really have no longer any interest in communism, that Moskov would still try to get you to name names. And the, um, the notion was, or the justification was, uh, to prove that you truly had broken with the Communist Party. You could only prove it by not 
um, trying to protect anybody uh, and giving the committee the information it needed, or giving, in this case, the superintendent of schools the information he needed to continue to, um, to uh, discover and root out all the subversive elements. Finally, in 1955, what becomes pressure and cajoling uh, becomes a condition of employment. And this is thanks to our friend George Timon. And the City Board of Education passes a resolution that basically says, if you don't name names of other people you saw at a meeting or knew who were in the party or thought were in the party, you lose your job. It's a condition of keeping your job. And this was the only Board of Education in the country that did, did that to, um, to the knowledge of anybody who was studying the issue and when the teachers union successfully challenged what I call the forced informer policy in the courts, both before the Commission of Education in the state and then in the courts, they won. Uh, and it really was a policy that um, was found morally objectionable by uh, lots of people um, across the political spectrum. Uh, but here's an example of one exchange. Um, a distraught teacher tells uh, Moskov that both uh, a prominent rabbi and his own father had warned him against informing. His father did so on the first night of Passover, no less. He used the word Moser. I didn't know what that word meant. He said it meant informer. And he pointed out to me what a reprehensible thing this would be to do, and that an informer was not to be buried in hallowed ground. Eventually, the city interrogated more than 1,000 school employees. 33 were fired um, for refusing to cooperate, essentially. But that, is, um, that doesn't give you a true sense of the uh, extent of the purge, because almost 300 resigned rather than go through this process of being interrogated, being forced to confess their sins, and being forced to inform on others. So there's a big debate going on nationally um, about academic freedom for communists. And this particular exchange between Sidney Hook, um, an ex-communist, and un like many ex-communists, but far from all, now had become a virulent anti-communist, um, and Alexander Nickel John, they're both philosophers. And it arises out of the first instance in which a university actually fires professors for nothing tenured professors for nothing more than being members of the Communist Party. Uh, and the argument that, that Hook and many others made is they are not entitled to academic freedom to the extent we think of academic freedom as something that protects um, their political activities outside the classroom and their scholarship as well as um, the work that they do um, inside the institution. Um, they're not entitled to it, and they're not entitled to remain in their teaching posts because, by definition, if they're in the Communist Party, they have um, relinquished their intellectual independence. Um, they no longer can be scholars. Um, Michael John points out that as long as people can leave, they haven't relinquished their intellectual independence. They're still thinking. Um, uh, whichever side you might think was more persuasive, uh, politically, clearly, hook side won. And um, the University of Washington firing of these two professors for nothing more than being in the Communist Party um, set the precedent uh, around the country. Almost all universities, with very few exceptions, took the same position. And if you were a former communist, you had to confess your sins, name names, before you could keep your job. OK, moving right along. So 1949. New York State Legislature passes the Feinberg Law, named after Benjamin Feinberg, a state senator. And it was very typical of many state laws, and it, as I mentioned, was really modeled on Truman's federal loyalty program. Um, <clears throat> so interestingly, New York already had two laws on the books that would seem to have addressed this presumed issue of subversive teachers. Uh, the first law dating from the, first, the very first Red Hunt um, around the time of World War I required dismissal from the public schools um, for, quote, utterance of any treasonable or seditious words or performance of any treasonable or seditious acts. No definition of what that meant. 
um, or di distribution of treasonable or seditious literature. The second law, um, passed in the late 30s, required the discharge of any civil service employee, so not just teachers, but broader group, who advocate the forceful overthrow of the government, i.e. revolution, or published material or joined a group with such an aim. So um, that would include the Declaration of Independence, presumably. Um, but these laws are on the books, uh, so you already have this kind of political test for employment. But the problem was, here we are in 1949, and how are these being enforced? unless something particularly comes to the attention of the Board of Education, uh, the Civil Service Commission, uh, there's no um, bureaucratic mechanism in place to root out, to find out who these folks are. There's no spying project. There's no uh, reporting requirements. There's no informers uh, being rewarded for um, turning in their neighbors and so forth. So the Feinberg Law sets up an administrative process a massive loyalty program. So the first quote is from the preamble to the law. Uh, and again, it's a mite, and there was never any evidence that um, left-wing teachers were doing any such thing uh, as um, indoctrinating children of tender years. OK, and then um, the second one is simply um, the guilt by association provision that is borrowed from the Truman Loyalty Program. And under the Feinberg Law, the State Board of Regents is going to do what the Attorney General is doing federally. They're going to create a list of subversive organizations. Um, and then this um, last piece is just carried over from the early law. Uh, this is the standard. So either you can be fired because you are accused of being in one of these organizations, uh, and there were hundreds of them under the Attorney General's list, the federal list, uh, and or uh, you could be fired for this <clears throat> utterance of supposedly treasonable or seditious language. Uh, and the Commissioner of Education follows up the Feinberg Law with a memo in which he specifies that the evidence to be considered in loyalty investigations goes well beyond anything that might happen in the classroom. Uh, the writing of articles, he says, the distribution of pamphlets, the endorsement of speeches made or articles written or acts performed by others all may constitute subversive activity. So the teachers union, there's actually three lawsuits filed to challenge the constitutionality of the Feinberg Law. And one reason why, as it turned out, a lot of my research centered on New York was uh, it, was, it was cases from New York that kept going up to the Supreme Court and leading to these decisions, in this case, Adler v. Board of Education, one of the truly all-time worst First Amendment decisions uh, in the annals of the Supreme Court. <clears throat> Basically, the majority opinion relies on an old, simplistic um, statement that Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes had made in the 1890s when he was Chief Justice of Massachusetts. And there was a case in which um, a policeman, I believe it was, uh, claimed he was fired for exercising his right to free speech. And Holmes says, you have a right to talk politics, but no right to a job. Um, well, there is no right to a job in the Constitution, but you would think Holmes was a smart guy and could have figured out that if you make your employment a, a conditional on um, suppression of your First Amendment right to free speech, um, you, are, you have created a First Amendment problem. Uh, so um, this remains the law, that there's no such thing as an unconstitutional condition on employment um, until somewhat later on in, in the history of the Supreme Court. Uh, so the only thing uh, that's worth remembering about the Adler case is Justice Douglas's dissent. Um, and here's some of it. Uh, he sees what the implications of this massive system of investigations uh, are. Uh, he says, this is certain to raise havoc with academic freedom. Um, teachers will shrink from any association that stirs controversy. And he gives some examples. What was the significance of the reference of the art teacher to socialism? Why was the history teacher so openly hostile to Franco-Spain? So everybody's looking over each other's shoulders. Um, he talks about the uh, turning the school system into a spying project. And he coins a phrase that 
Justice Brennan will use 15 years later when the Adler case is overruled um, in a case called Kiyoshin versus Board of Regents, which I will tell you about. Uh, Brennan was great at borrowing good language from other people, often without attribution. Uh, so this uh, metaphor of a pole cast over the classrooms we're going to see again uh, in the case 15 years later that overrules uh, Adler. But 1952, they lose, uh, and the purge goes on. And of course, although this only involves the Feinberg Law, the precedent is set all over the country for similar loyalty programs. So 1952, back in New York City, let's move to Queens College. Um, the Senate Internal Security Subcommittee, also known as the CIS, comes to town. So in addition to HUAC and the McCarthy Committee, um, there's another Senate committee, the McCarran Committee, run by Pat McCarran, which is also in on the act of uh, investigating various um, sectors of American society and education continues to be a big favorite. And they are focusing on professors at the then free uh, city colleges, there were four, City, Brooklyn, Queens, and Hunter. And um, on their staff were several people from the old Rap Kudir Committee. And they remembered that there were people at Brooklyn College um, and elsewhere who, against whom there was only one witness and who were still had their jobs. So part of the goal of the, of the CIS was uh, to finish the job of Rap Kudir. And the other part of it, interwoven with it, uh, was to pre pressure the Board of Higher Education to do the same kind of things that the Board of Education was already doing very vigorously uh, to really embark on a massive kind of investigation of individual teachers. Uh, Vera Schlockman, somebody I met uh, in, the, um, in the archives for the most part, she's still alive, she's about 103. Um, she's not in a position to be interviewed, but um, an amazing person. Um, she was um, a professor at Queens, a pioneer in labor history. She wrote a very um, well-received book in the new field of labor history that had to do with the company town. Uh, she was on the letterhead of the College Teachers Union, which is probably why she was called in. And um, she also resisted the committee on basically grounds of free speech, that they're, they're inquiring into areas of free inquiry necessary to the preservation of self-government, she says. She refuses to answer questions, but as we know, there's some precedents on the book, the Hollywood 10 case and others. Um, you're gonna go to jail for contempt of Congress if you refuse to cooperate with the committee based on the First Amendment. So by this time, lawyers have figured out you can also assert your Fifth Amendment right not to be forced to testify against yourself. Uh, so she asserts the Fifth Amendment as well. Um, however, there was a provision in the New York City Charter that um, provided for the, uh, essentially the immediate firing of anybody um, uh, in, in city employment who um, asserted the Fifth Amendment and refused to testify in, a, in an investigation. And it came out of the uh, Seabury investigations of corruption in New York City where policemen um, and Tammany Hall grafters were refusing to testify. So it had an understandable origin, but now it is being turned against teachers, and frankly, even if that provision hadn't been on the books, um, they probably would have lost their jobs. So uh, Slackman, um, Harry Slackauer from Brooklyn College was another one who now uh, was called again uh, before the CIS, and he stands on his Fifth Amendment privilege. Um, they are both fired within two weeks with no hearing. They're tenured professors uh, fired simply for asserting their Fifth Amendment rights. And there were more than a dozen others uh, in addition to some teachers in the K-12 level, level le um, at the K-12 level. Um, and another one who um, uh, lost his job somewhat later, 1953 now, CIS uh, has left New York, is back in Washington, but they're still calling people from New York. And Shaftel was quite feisty. He was an English professor. He went on at some length before the committee. Uh, and here's an example of the way in which he's um, uh, coming from a defensive to an offensive position. Uh, and he tells the CIS that um, 
He thinks communists can be competent teachers, in fact. Uh, and he gives the example of Picasso, probably competent to teach art. So the fired professors um, bring uh, challenges to this business of being summarily fired uh, simply for asserting their constitutional rights. Uh, but only Harry Slacker's case gets to the Supreme Court um, for a variety of technical reasons. And the Supreme Court in 1956, in fact, rules that um, it violates due process to fire a tenured professor um, without any hearing, um, any inquiry into the reasons for uh, his or her action. Uh, court is a narrow opinion, Slockhauer versus Board of Higher Education. The court does not say that they couldn't fire Slockhauer or anybody else for being a communist, but um, simply for standing on their Fifth Amendment rights, that that was a violation of due process. So what happens? Um, Gideon's reinstates Slockhauer for about five minutes and then immediately fires him for uh, perjury um, and for um, lying um, allegedly uh, to the, but probably he did, to the, um, to the Brooklyn College um, committee that was responding. He was up for a promotion and he had to write a letter at, at Gideon's uh, insistence um, denying any Communist Party membership ever. So he's immediately suspended and brought up on charges and he's going to have a hearing. Um, meanwhile, the other professors who should have been entitled to the benefit of this Slockhauer decision establishing um, that you cannot fire somebody arbitrarily without a hearing simply for asserting their constitutional right, the city refuses to apply the decision to any of the other professors, and there's this correspondence in the files where the lawyers are arguing that they should, and the city's taking every kind of possible narrow interpretation. There's actually a stipulation in one case that uh, between the city and the lawyers for about six of the professors, that whatever the results of the cases that would be litigated would be applied to um, the people, uh, the other people that they were representing. The city refused to honor that. Okay, so among the students who protested the dismissals at Queens College was an English major na named Harry Kayishian. Um, interesting coincidence, and Harry is still around and not very old. And he told me that he was uh, really not very political at the time, 1952. He was mostly interested in girls. Um, but there was sufficient indignation among students about the firing of both Oscar Chaptel and Vera Schlackman, very popular professors, that he joined a protest committee. Didn't do any good, but um, he would become the lead plaintiff in the case that eventually overturned the Adler case and invalidated the Feinberg Law, and with it, in fact, uh, the whole nationwide system of loyalty investigations. It came not until 1967, so a little late uh, for some people. But here's Harry, he, he goes on from Queens College to become an English instructor at what had been a private university of Buffalo. University of Buffalo gets taken over by the SUNY system, state university system, and all of a sudden everybody's a public employee subject to the Feinberg Law. And um, because the Feinberg Law requires such a vast administrative apparatus of investigations, the state, the SUNY trustees decided, well, we can short circuit the process, this is my interpretation, we can short circuit the process by simply re requiring everybody to sign a loyalty oath, um, which was called the Feinberg Certificate. And you had to agree that the terms of your employment included all this stuff about no seditious distribution of literature, seditious statements and um, membership in any of these organizations. Uh, and that you never had been a member of the Communist Party, and if you ever were, you had disclosed this to the boss. Um, so this is 1960, early 60s, so times are changing a little bit, and um, the faculty is outraged by this uh, Feinberg requirement that is now everybody's got to sign this pledge. But 
not a big surprise when it came right down to refusing and losing your job. Um, there were only five um, people on the faculty who were willing to um, go forward with that and file a new lawsuit challenging um, essentially the Feinberg Law. And so here they are, Harry with his, he was an English instructor, so there's his T.S. Eliot dartboard, T.S. Eliot in the middle. Um, Newton Garver had a, he was a Quaker, he's still around in Buffalo. Um, his kids are now somewhat older than that. But um, he was a Quaker and um, they, many of them take the position that any kind of judicial oath like that is inconsistent with Quaker practice. So he refused. Uh, Ralph Maud, a Welshman, he had an interesting reason. He was a kind of feisty guy. And uh, he's still around, although not in Buffalo. Uh, an expert on the poetry of Dylan Thomas, that may explain something. He explained that to me that he was married to a, quote, wonderful Trotskyist Jewess who would not let him sign the oath on pain of withdrawing marital privileges. <laughs> so, that was Ralph. Um, George, also an English professor, he told me that he'd been in a free, free, free speech fight at a at Ohio State, and the experience of being rolled over by the university administration made him determined that I would never let it happen again. And he had quite a lot of uh, not very complimentary words to say about his colleagues who were up in arms about this oath requirement, uh, but then signed it. Um, didn't think that they understood very much about academic freedom. And George Starbuck um, was already a prize-winning poet. He had a job in the library, and um, he taught a course in the English department. Um, the AAUP chapter, the American Association of University Professors uh, chapter at Buffalo, did ask the law faculty to do a legal memo, uh, tell them what the chances were, it's now like 1963, uh, for actually knocking out the Feinberg Law. We're now um, in the Earl Warren Court. There are some good precedents on First Amendment, but the Adler case has not been overruled. Uh, the law school faculty says, you're not gonna win. One of them, I think Ralph Maud, was doing his own legal research, and he, there's a, a correspondence in the file up in Buffalo uh, between him and Leonard Boudin. Well-known then, a uh, radical lawyer in New York, certainly not afraid of a challenge. Uh, had met, represented many lefties um, in challenges to various aspects of the McCarthy era. Um, and Boudin writes him back and says, you know, you don't really have much of a chance. So they do find a lawyer in Buffalo to bring this case, and um, he loses in the lower courts. But by the time the case gets to the Supreme Court, it's late 1966, decision comes out in um, January 1967. And even in 1967, it's a squeaky five to four majority, four dissents. And the significance of the Kiyoshian case, um, the decision that Justice Brennan wrote, there's a variety of things to say about it. One is that you could say there were precedents, good First Amendment precedents, striking down one loyalty oath because it was too vague, striking down some other aspect, uh, interpreting the Smith Act more narrowly, Smith Act under which the leaders of the Communist Party had been uh, convicted and imprisoned for a conspiracy to advocate the overthrow of the government at some undetermined future time, basically um, put in jail for teaching Marxism. Um, Supreme Court by the late 50s is narrowing the interpretation of the Smith Act, so it can't be used to put people in jail simply for being a member of the Communist Party or advocating Marxism. Um, so there are some useful precedents, but <clears throat> What Kiyoshian does is it doesn't um, sort of chip away at one aspect or another of this, um, what is now really a 20 year um, period of political repression. It comes straight out and says, guilt by association is not something we tolerate in our society and legal system. Uh, and the provisions, these provisions which are very standard in loyalty laws, um, anybody who advocates the overthrow of the government by unlawful means, those provisions are too vague and too broad, uh, and he gives a variety of hypothetical examples, including the Declaration of Independence, the Communist Manifesto, and so forth. And then, finally, because 
Kirshin is about teachers, there is this famous language about academic freedom. Uh, and as you can see at the bottom there, um, he borrows Justice Douglas's line from the dissent in Adler, um, First Amendment doesn't tolerate laws that cast a pole of orthodoxy over the classroom. Well, you can see from this um, cartoon, which I found in the papers of probably Justice Brennan uh, in the Library of Congress, um, even in 1967, uh, <clears throat> demonizing communists was still a national pastime, at least in some parts of the country. And the caption, if you can't read it, is, uh, the wolf is in the hen house, and he says, get lost. The Supreme Court says you're a menace to academic freedom to the poor farmer. OK, we're going to jump ahead, because I probably talked too long. Um, <clears throat> After the Kiyoshin decision, there's a variety of efforts being made by these indefatigable lawyers in New York, both on behalf of the teachers who were fired by the Board of Education and the professors who were fired by the Board of Higher Education. And the basic claim is, guess what? What you did turns out to have been unconstitutional. Uh, you should give some compensation to these folks. Um, and Suffice it to say, the city was not all that receptive to this argument. And actually, the Board of Education came around sooner. And in 1972, 73, it entered into a settlement with um, <clears throat> 33 teachers, including Irving Adler, uh, the plaintiff in the Adler case, the lead plaintiff in the Adler case. The Board of Higher Education held out even longer. And it wasn't until 1982. Uh, and there's, there's wonderful correspondence in the Tamnet Library from Oscar and Vera here looking somewhat older uh, than they did in 1952. Um, just bugging everybody um, that they could think of, people on, uh, on the city council, Mayor Lindsay, um, people on uh, the city corporation council's office, the law office, uh, arguing for some kind of compensation uh, for the folks who've been, as it now turned out, unlawfully fired. Um, and finally, in 1982, there is a settlement. And um, here are Vera and Oscar at the press conference where the city lawyers are, are claiming great credit for this. But it really was quite a saga. Uh, the Kishin case is sort of the climax of the book. And those of a pessimistic frame of mind could say it's been all downhill since then, uh, certainly in the courts. Uh, for academic freedom, and I talk about that in the book. Uh, what about the court of public opinion, and what about political repression and free speech generally? So just a couple of examples. Um, this famous comment by uh, Bill Maher, uh, after Bill Maher on TV observed that the World Trade Center terrorists, however evil and misguided, were not cowards. Ari Fleischer, White House Press Secretary, warns all Americans need to watch what they say and watch what they do. Uh, there were teachings around the country where Middle East scholars tried to talk about some of the complex issues uh, behind the terrorist attacks. Um, one at City College, which you may remember, the New York Post takes some quotes from some of the uh, presentations that had been made out of context. and. Um, uh, calls this a peace fest dominated by blind, stupid, or intellectually dishonest academics. And the CUNY trustees voted to condemn the teaching as seditious. And then there was <clears throat> University of Colorado professor Ward Churchill, um, an example of why um, unattractive plaintiffs can make very bad law. Uh, but it's really the judges who make the bad law. Um, and you may remember this incident. Churchill writes an article just after September 11th in which he uses this comparison of stock traders at the World Trade Center uh, to Eichmann because, and he explains, if you look at the article, of their complicity in economic exploitation all over the globe uh, and profiting from the violence that uh, he said was um, engaged in by the United States in order to um, to, um, <clears throat> uh, to, to shore up the system of global capitalism. So um, whatever the um, persuasiveness of his political arguments, he certainly chose an unfortunate comparison. Um, 
the article was relatively obscure for about six years, and somebody discovered it in upstate New York um, College when he was um, invited to speak. And then it went, as we say, viral. Uh, well, the University of Colorado apparently believed he had a First Amendment right to state his opinion, however offensive, uh, without losing his job. Um, because, among other things, cases like Kayishi and did away with that old um, uh, epigram that uh, you could have a constitutional right to talk politics but not to a job. Um, so they looked for other reasons to fire him. They set up a committee. The committee looked at his uh, writings. They found some evidence of what they called research misconduct, bad footnoting practices, and um, dismissed him from his tenured position. So Churchill goes to court. Uh, in Colorado, and a jury finds that, not surprisingly, this research misconduct was a pretext, and the real reason they got rid of him was incredible political pressure to do just that. Um, but uh, the judge decided first that um, he wouldn't reinstate Churchill in any event. The way these lawsuits work is juries can award damages, and in this case, I think they awarded a dollar. Um, and it's up to the judge to decide if he's going to issue an injunction, a court order, um, putting him back to work. And he basically says, um, he's not very popular on campus. I'm not going to send him back. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to overturn the jury's verdict because I've just decided that the committee that um, uh, decided uh, that he was guilty of research misconduct and recommended his firing, they were quasi-judicial. They were enough like a court that um, they're immune from being sued even if they made a mistake. So judicial immunity was invented by judges to make sure judges didn't get sued for their mistakes. And now this, in Colorado, this has now been extended to university committees that have some semblance of judicial-like proceedings. So uh, a really bad um, uh, precedent in the law upheld by the Colorado Supreme Court, but only the law in Colorado. So. Uh, <clears throat> Concluding remarks. Uh, Ellen Schrecker, whose book, Now Every Tower, is um, the sort of Bible of researchers in this area, a great book, McCarthyism in the Universities, um, concludes toward the end of that book, and I quote her, uh, that the prolonged red scare of the Cold War period not only helped, quote, to destroy whatever influence communism had within American society, but it silenced the rest of the left as well. For over a decade at the height of the Cold War, meaningful dissent had been all but eliminated. And I quote another historian, Richard Goldstein, who's written a massive tome on political repression in the US, who goes a bit further. And he says that today, despite the wealth of the United States, it has, it has quote, among the least adequate government social programs, um, of all industrialized democracies and, quote, the most unequal distribution of wealth. And although he says political repression alone is not responsible, it has significantly contributed to the shaping of a political system that is exceptionally narrow in the kinds of ideas that can be safely propounded and considered. Uh, so in other words, um, calling somebody a socialist in this country is not going to be very helpful to their, shall we say, to take an example. Uh, out of thin air, their election prospects. Um, in Europe, being called a socialist would be completely ho-hum. Uh, so, final conclusion. Although cases like Kiyashian, which the Supreme Court, as the book recounts, has cast some doubt on, but has not overruled, um, although they celebrate academic freedom in language that is wonderful to quote, and has become part of our national literature and consciousness, I think. Uh, in fact, Kiyoshin came too late uh, for a lot of people. It could not restore the careers and lost years of gifted um, teachers and, writer and scholars like Vera Schlackman, about whom one um, labor historian has written that she was in some sense, um, in some sense, those of us who do labor history remain the intellectual children of Vera Schlackman, and those like her who belonged to a generation stopped in its tracks. So should I stay here for questions? Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Oh, good. Yes, yes. 
Um, probably. The, um, the teachers' union certainly thought so in some of their pamphlets uh, and leaflets talk about the double standard um, that they say is being applied or anti-Semitic comments that they hear that are overheard at 110 Livingston Street, which is, was the headquarters of the Board of Education. Uh, so, uh, you know, when you look at the 1930s, uh, anti-Semitism in American society is so um, widespread that um, it was less shocking than, than it is now. Yes. Why did you do these things? Thank you. I learned so much. Um, you've come a long way. Even if you live in a city now where even if you were once a Sandra Hitchcock, you can be elected mayor. <laughs> you, you showed Bernard Vassoy. He was one of my teachers. This was at Bronx High School of Science in 52 and 53. He was an art teacher. And I knew, we knew at the time he was in some kind of hot water, but we did not know exactly what. And I'm amazed that 61 years later, I recognize his name. I still have a question. Um, George Simone, I will include in a Hebrew book, talk to them more. But to call somebody called fascist, I guess you're using that term now, I don't know if that was used then. We had just finished fighting Hitler. That was quite an epithet to hurl at someone. Was he, was he a point or a, what was he? Um, there was, um, he was involved, he was um, a lawyer very involved in Catholic political affairs. And it was not unusual in the 1930s for uh, there to be, uh, wholly apart from the Christian front and the really um, out front Nazi anti-Semitic kind of activity that was going on uh, in many places, including Brooklyn and the Bronx and Manhattan. Um, there were, it was widespread report, uh, support for Mussolini uh, and the fascist regime in Italy. So there were, there was documentation of Timon's support, uh, co-sponsorship of rallies, a big rally in Madison Square Garden in support of uh, Italian fascism. And the teachers union and others uh, who opposed Tim Timon, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> there was a lot of opposition to Timon's appointment. It was sort of, there was no kind of process. It was announced. <coughs> and then a lot of opposition was articulated. And these uh, leaflets with his name on them, co-sponsoring these rallies, um, were published in PM, newspaper PM, as well as in the teachers union um, newspaper. So there was documentation of that. And at the time, I, mean, I just read a book um, called The Third Reich and the Ivory Tower, and it documents in really nauseating detail um, the way in which all of the Ivy League colleges and seven sister schools um, kept up their um, exchanges with German universities well into the Nazi period, really until almost 1938, 39. Uh, and welcomed ambassadors from Nazi Germany and feted them uh, at reunions and so forth. Uh, so um, there was you know, just very widespread, uh, and, and certainly there was a lot of opposition, uh, and the Communist Party made you know, great, a great deal of progress with the Popular Front against fascism, and certainly a lot of concern, but there was um, good reason for it, for that concern, because fascism was um, had a fair amount of support in the United States. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, you, yes, yes. Um, it depended. Um, I mean, the, the, the fates of these folks um, ranged from um, at least one of the professors at the University of, of Washington uh, who ended up on Skid Row, I mean, could not, I mean, he was an English professor, a, a, an expert in medieval English literature, you know, sent out thousands of resumes, could not get an academic job ever again. Um, so that's one extreme. The other extreme is um, my dad had a fraternity brother at City College now. They weren't really fraternities, but they sort of called them fraternities. 
who, who went on to have a, get a PhD in chemistry and was, had a job at uh, City and lost his job as a result of the Rap Kudair hearings. And well, of course, I knew none of this in my childhood, but all I knew was he, had, he was a very prosperous engineer in private corporate employment. Uh, so people went on to, some of them went on to earn more money uh, and have successful careers. They lost the opportunity to be teachers, which is what they originally wanted. Irving Adler, who was a math teacher, uh, <laughs> um, went on to write almost 100 books now. Uh, in the um, Peace of Our Democracy, I say over 100 books. Well, Peggy Adler got in touch with me and said, no. It was less than 100. It was only 97 or something. So in the paperback, when it comes out, eventually, that's going to be corrected. But Irving wrote, was very successful. Uh, and he just died last year, I think, a ripe old age. Um, at writing books uh, about science and math uh, for children as well as for adults, and he did very well. Uh, somebody like Vera Schlackman was sort of in the middle, uh, and it took eight years before she could get back into academia with a job at Adelphi. Um, she was unemployed for a year. She uh, got, her, got a job as a secretary in a school and uh, finally got some sort of academic position at Adelphi in social work school. And, um, ended up her career at Columbia School of Social Work. So she did get back into academia and she was much beloved by her students. And uh, actually there was an event at Queens College about 10 years ago uh, when there was a sort of exhibit, you know, anti-communism at Queens College and an event um, that honored her and uh, she appeared. So, but she never did get back on track. Now whether she would have produced another great book if, if this hadn't happened, it's, it's hard to know. There was a lot of psychological damage, even to people who um, were able to get back into academia or who did well in the corporate sector. Because the FBI was following you. You knew there was a file. You get the free, anybody can get um, the FBI files on people who are now dead, um, heavily redacted, of course. but. Um, they were all on the security index, which meant any time there was a declaration of national emergency, they could all be rounded up. Um, there's a, just one example of FBI investigation reported in, um, I think it was Frederick Ewan's um, FBI file, that um, they were interviewing his neighbors, they were interviewing the super in his building who reported that he had you know, interracial guests at his home. That was noted by the FBI as a subversive piece mm -hmm. of evidence. So, you know, this kind of surveillance and the, the damage to the kids, you know, who are called, you know, your, your father's a commie, et cetera, et cetera. A uh, lot of, you know, wholly apart from the economic, a lot of psychological harm. Yes, yes. Well, I always feel like one of the ironies of your career is evidence by the father of There's a, you know, there's a, uh, many stories that come out of City College. Uh, one of them involves um, a professor named Moses Finley, um, who was a brilliant uh, historian and subsequently went to England, basically exiled himself from the United States during this period. And I think he was knighted uh, and became a very celebrated uh, professor, uh, scholar in England uh, of ancient history, many other subjects. And years later, when there was an event um, uh, at City College uh, to honor some of the people who'd been driven out of teaching by the Rap Kudair Committee, um, it was pointed out that, you know, look at, look at all the superstars that City College lost. Yes. Um, I think somebody mentioned, yeah, you mentioned, we knew this teacher was in some kind of trouble. 
but we didn't really know what. I mean, I think the, the students in the colleges knew what was going on, but in the, I mean, there was so much shame and guilt um, associated with this that at the K-12 level, you know, the teacher would disappear and nobody really knew and a lot of people didn't talk about, I mean, even uh, children of communists or former communists, so-called red diaper babies in my generation, basically, I wasn't one, but, uh, you know, the, the ones I talked to say, my parents didn't talk about this. Um, good question. I mean, I don't entirely know the answer to that. Uh, certainly the teachers union had a curriculum committee and until um, the walls just came tumbling down, um, and another, another re resolution that Timon got through the Board of Education was basically to blacklist the teachers union from any kind of negotiation with the, with the city or the board. Uh, they would meet before that happened, they would meet with the Board of Education curriculum people uh, and propose things like a curriculum that would have some um, positive things to say about African American history and culture. Uh, so I, I, I don't know the answer as to whether the Board of Education in New York published a curriculum. Um, I don't have any evidence that if they did so, anybody was um, charged with having strayed beyond it, but I'll, I'll give you one story which is told in the book uh, early on in um, so well before the, the Feinberg law, so we're talking 1947-48, uh, there's an incident in which um, one of the teachers who was pictured as one of the eight, first eight to be fired, well before that, he's teaching at Tilden High School and he's teaching social studies. And uh, the, the department chairman comes in to observe, and it's a, it's a class on the United Nations. And um, the department chairman basically writes up a positive report, but he does note that um, he thought this, this uh, class, that the teacher had tilted it a little bit against the United States uh, position on an issue uh, having to do with the veto power in, in the United, in Security Council, I think. And, um, you know, it should have been more pro-American. Um, but, you know, basically it was approval of his teaching. Well, the, the, the um, principal of Tilden High School is a guy named Abe Lefkowitz. And if you go back to the 30s, Lefkowitz and another teacher named Linville were among the founders of the Teachers Union. Uh, and in the 30s, there was this battle for power within the Teachers Union. And uh, they are the anti-communist um, liberals, and they are um, trying to preserve their power uh, in the face of what they would have said was underhanded tactics by communists uh, to take over the teachers' union. Uh, but another interpretation of that might be uh, the communists and people who were close to um, communism or who were more left um, viewed the union as something more than a bread and butter Union that was going to act, try to get better conditions and wages um, for teachers. Uh, view the union as a much more um, uh, wide ranging in its progressive agenda and demands and much more militant in its tactics. So things like um, mass demonstrations and taking a bus up to Albany to carry picket signs. And Leftwoods and Linville and their allies thought that that was a terrible idea. And the communists and their allies won. And Lefkowitz and Linville leave the Teachers Union and start the Teachers Guild, 
which is a liberal anti-communist group. So here is Lefkowitz, the principal of children, and he reads this report. Uh, and he decides to make a little more of it. And he writes this memo um, to the teacher involved, Willie Jaffe, uh, saying, we have academic freedom at Tilden High School, but we do not permit um, un-American or disloyal teaching. Uh, so they don't really have academic freedom because what is un-American or disloyal teaching? So Jaffe said it was a balanced, he presented a balanced lesson. Uh, now, you could argue that um, what he thought was a balanced lesson, somebody else would think was communist indoctrination. But um, he actually protests this bad mark on his record, this reprimand, all the way up through the board of superintendents who agree with him that he presented a balanced lesson. And this is like 1948. Um, but they say, the atmosphere of the social studies department at Tilden High School is not, no longer hospitable to Louis Jaffe, so they transfer him to Erasmus. <laughs> but, you know, so this is not, nobody's accusing him of departing from some standard curriculum. But what is communist indoctrination and what is a balanced lesson is all very subjective at this point. I'm going to take two more questions because we want to have time to sell the book and for Marjorie to sign. Yes? Uh, in 1954, when you came to high school, there was some trouble with family things. My parents hired a math tutor, a teacher, Irving Bauer, who had been replaced by the Board of Education for Family Issues, and he came to the sign of the Feinberg Statement. Did he uh, teach it to all those who were dismissed eventually to do some sort of Um, there were 33 who were officially dismissed, and there were 33 who eventually got uh, some compensation, but I don't think it was exactly the same 33. If you simply resigned, um, you got nothing. So you had to be, you had to go through the whole process of being officially dismissed, and most people just, you know, they left. Once you, certainly once you got the letter from, from Moscow, they mostly left. Yes, last question right there. You, yes. No, behind you, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the things go forward to the current day, there are certain things that seem to me to be similar between Cardinal Stone and urging the other guard to form a known, but it's in a rather extremist view that the students won't leave because of their faith in the teacher. It's time to go back to the classroom. Um, the, the feeling toward Uh, yeah, um, and comparisons to the McCarthy era are always being made. I mean, you go back to the period of supposed political correctness where allegedly um, universities got taken over by lefty professors. Um, the conservatives said, well, it's McCarthyism returning to the universities. And now, I mean, it's a fair point. Uh, it's not McCarthyism, um, and we don't have these kinds of wide-ranging investigative committees and just by association, but you're certainly right that um, these battles, these ideological battles continue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And anybody who wants to talk, I'll, I guess I'll be right outside. Yeah. yeah.